Oh man, that is cool. Whoa. That is cool. April of last year, and I was looking to get an exercise bike so that I could train in here and do some cardio that would complement my running and my lifting. I knew nothing about exercise bikes or indeed bikes, so I spoke to my neighbor who did. Straight away, he said, you need to get a Wahoo kicker bike. I said, never heard of it. Surely I need to get the Peloton bike. It's got a massive screen. It's the Tesla of exercise bikes. Eventually, he stopped laughing and said, no, you need the Wahoo. It is as close as you can get to the sensation of riding a real bike indoors. Plug it into Zwift and you think you're outside. I said, what's Zwift? He said, it's a computer game. I said, like Gears of War? He said, no, and if that's your frame of reference, you're gonna be severely disappointed when you see the graphics. I said, I hear you, you mean more like Counter-Strike. He said, just buy the bloody bike. It is worth every penny of its 3,000 pounds. I said, 3,000 pounds? Get the out of here. No! I cannot, it's serious because it's very important. I said I don't even ride a real bike, so I wouldn't know whether it was close to outdoors anyway. Are you sure the Peloton is not the thing to get? That screen is huge. And then he said, the Wahoo will tilt up and down depending on whether you're riding up or downhill on its own automatically like a robot bike simulator machine if that was a real thing. And I was sold. Bike arrived a week later. First thing I did was play around with the tilt function and loved it. It was more exciting than it looked there. Racing on Zwift with it was awesome. Even my wife thought it was cool, although she did say, why has it not got a big screen like the Peloton? But here is the problem with the tilt. Over the last year and a half, I've come to regard it a little bit like the fancy LCD display that is my BMW's dashboard. When I first sat in that car and it all lit up and you could pick the type of dials you wanted and the color and the graphics, and it flashed your name up when you got in, depending on whose remote control had been used to open the car, I thought, this is the best feature of this car. I don't know how I got this far in life using cars with analog dials. And after a couple of weeks, I forgot about it. And so it is with a kicker bike. I love the bike. I recommend it to anybody considering buying one. It has got me in the best shape of my life and it has taken my training in completely new directions. But I mostly ride flat courses. I often forgot to turn the tilt function on and now I hardly ever bother with it. It's cool, it's clever, but it's not as big a deal as I thought on day one. And so when Wahoo hooked me up with a regular Wahoo trainer for my P3X to ride in here over the winter, it's tiny and included the climb unit, I was like, okay, the trainer is brilliant, but I haven't even unboxed the climb yet. And then the other night, I got in the car. Nights are drawing in here in the UK, and it was the first time I'd been in the, in the dark in ages. And the screen lit up, it said, welcome Mark. And the dials glowed and things flashed away like Knight Rider. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I should probably set up that kicker climb. What's all this? Looks like Darth Vader's bathroom. And so here we are, is this, the Wahoo Kicker Climb, as cool as it needs to be to justify its cost? Because this is a very different proposition to the Kicker Bike. The bike comes with tilt, it's included, and I'd recommend it even if it didn't. Basically, tilt is a freebie. But you can obviously buy a Kicker Trainer without the Climb. In fact, adding the Climb means more hassle, more things to set up. So this needs to be really good. Don't you hate it when your kids go through your tools? Ooh. So as I see it, there are really two aspects to test here. And I should add, in case you're new to my channel, when I say test, I mean play about with and tell you how I get on. There are alternative channels out there that will give you plenty of graphs and figures and science when reviewing something. I give you jokes and movie clips, just so we are all on the same page. So number one, how straightforward is this gonna to be to set up? I figure this will be used by two types of rider. The first is someone putting a bike onto this and a trainer and then leaving it there for a long time. Maybe the entirety of the winter season. Maybe it's a permanent indoor rig for them. For them, setting this up might be less of an issue. The second is the one that will be taking their bike off and on, either to use their bike outside, or in my case, also to jump across to the kicker bike. I don't have room in here for both at the same time. In that case, installation needs to be quick and easy. And then number two is the riding experience, obviously. Let's get it on the bike first, though. Our initial impressions 
Initial impressions are good. It's very light. Um, I'll weigh it. I won't weigh it. I'll look up how much it weighs. Uh, it's very easy to move around, which is important in here when I'm clearing things out of the way to make space. It's small in the sense it's very slim, so it'll find a space up against the wall really easily. Uh, looks typical Wahoo. Looks really good. Uh, you do. Uh, you get what you pay for. Um, the plastics look decent quality. The bits that are. Is it metal? I don't know what it's made from. Looks pretty cool. Okay, we like that. Let's put it on the bike. Okay, that is now done. Uh, now I know what I'm doing. I reckon I could take the front wheel out and put that unit in its place in under a minute. So certainly very, very straightforward. No hassle in terms of setup. Uh, the only extra bits that it came with that I didn't need were some different size adapters. I'm using a 12 millimeter through axle on my Cervelo. If you have a different size through axle or a quick release, bag of bits uh, there, I don't need those. So those go in a poo bag, uh, one of the dog's poo bags for storage. What else was there? Nothing else really. Foreign power lead gone in the bin. Power leads plugged in. That was it, very, very straightforward. That's the hardware done. Software next, I need to link it to my Wahoo app on my phone so I can tell it that I'm on a Cervelo. Uh, and the measurements of it because it needs to know, basically needs to work out the right angle or dangle. Uh, I can't do that right now though because my iPhone is currently updating itself onto my new iPhone 13 Pro Max thingy. That process has still got an hour to go. Once that's done, get my phone, get my Wahoo app, talk to the unit, and yeah, step two. Okay, we're good to go. New iPhone uh, rocking and rolling, and only a single page of instructions once you've physically put the bike on the unit. Plug in the bike, done that. Pair it to the trainer. Okay, the trainer has this little remote control gadget here. Hold that down until it flashes. Flashing. It's now paired. <laughs> that was relatively straightforward. Okay, so it is paired with my trainer, so my front and back end are talking to each other. Leveling the kicker climb. Okay, open your Wahoo Fitness app. So let me talk briefly about the setup there because when I filmed that yesterday, the phone part took longer than it should have done because my new iPhone had not yet updated the Wahoo app. No fault of Wahoo's. Bottom line, very simple. The front wheel gets swapped with the climb unit, which is first fitted with the right adapter, depending on whether your bike has a quick release or a through axle. Obviously, you only do that once, and they should be putting different bikes that need different adapters on it. And then the very first time you use it, you push and hold one button on the wired remote to link it to the trainer at the back. That is because any program you're using, like Zwift, is talking only with your trainer. The trainer at the back then relays the information to the front. So at no point do you need to tell your training software you're using the climb, which is good, one less thing to deal with. And then you open up your Wahoo app, which finds it like any other sensor. You can see on my phone, I've got the kicker bike, the fan, the trainer, and now the climb linked to the trainer. And from there, you just take your wheelbase, which is the distance between your two axles. Mine was slightly longer than the default setting, which makes sense because my bike is an extra large man size. Now the reason it is your wheelbase is because a shorter bike will require less upward movement at the front to give any particular angle of incline. Up a couple of inches here, creates less of an angle than going up a couple of inches here. And that we will come back to later because it allows you to hack some issues that you'll probably encounter, especially on something like Zwift. So the very first time you set the thing up, it'll probably take you five minutes and every time thereafter, it is simply a case of chucking it on the front wheel and you are good to go. After you have made sure it's sitting dead middle under your axle, which you do like this. So I guess that is now it. I now need to center it by basically lifting the handlebars up, letting it hang free. and put it down again. <laughs> that is pretty much it. And I think it's kind of ready to go from there. Let's have a little manual play. Okay, that is very, very cool looking. I'm gonna jump on the bike over ride now. I'm gonna have some dinner first, and then gonna ride on uh, a route on Zwift that I asked uh, already on YouTube. I said, where's a good place to go where there's lots of bumps and hills? I was told, something grove. Biker Grove, I can't remember. Biker Grove, that would be quite appropriate, wouldn't it? Uh, Americans are thinking, what the hell is Biker Grove? <laughs> Titans Grove, doesn't matter. I'm gonna ride it after dinner. Uh, lots of ups and downs, yeah.
back later. Okay, this next bit is the fun bit. I'm gonna take the bike for a ride. I'm on Zwift, I'm gonna go over some bumps and see what the front end feels like with the kicker climb on it. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking anymore tonight because it is freezing in here. I just wanna get on the bike and ride it. I'll be doing the talking over the top from tomorrow. If I get a chance, if my fingers don't go blue, I'll swap bikes over and I'll get on the kicker bike as well tonight and so I can get some sort of side-by-side -side comparisons going on. Uh, for now, we're ready to go. So as I was cycling towards Titans Grove there, let me take you through how the ride went last night. Actually, first of all, if you've not yet subscribed to the channel, please take a moment to do so. If only out of respect for the fact that last night I was in here freezing my ass off when I could have been sat in the warm playing with my new giant iPhone. Such is my commitment to you. Right. The very first thing you see me doing there was stopping and putting the training difficulty to 100%. For those of you who don't understand training difficulty, if you have it set to 50%, it means that when you encounter a hill, say 10%, it will only feel like a hill of 5%. Don't make the mistake of thinking that makes it easier though, because basically it's just re-gearing your bike. So yeah, it feels easier going up that hill that previously took say 300 watts, but just like putting your bike in an easy gear to go up something steep outside and make it feel easy, you'll be going slower. If you want to go as fast, you need to pedal much faster, let's end up generating the same 300 watts at a higher cadence. I lower training difficulty because it means that racing I can pedal more consistently, I don't have to stir the pot so much. That's a reference to making manual gear changes on a car. You don't do that in an American auto or use your left hand. This is becoming a very anti-American video. First biker grove and now stick shifting. Anyway, problem here is that if you're running at 50% difficulty, thus dropping the feel of a 10% gradient to 5%, the kicker climb will only tilt you to 5% and getting the full experience is what we're after. So I used 100%. Now, if you don't want to adjust your difficulty to 100%, there's a fix. Remember that I said the wheelbase dictates how much height at the front is needed to give any given angle. You just use an artificial wheelbase input to the Wahoo app. Very simply, if Wahoo thinks your bike is twice as long as it is, it will need to get the front end twice as high. Thus that 5% gradient becomes a 10% it should be. Likewise, if you're using 20% difficulty with a wheelbase of say 1000 millimeters, you just divide that by 0.2 and that'll give you 5,000 millimeters as your wheelbase to enter into the app. 80% difficulty, you divide it by 0.8 and that'll give you 1250. Obvious question, can you jack those numbers right up and have the unit move you between the climb unit's maximum tilt of 20% up and 10% down just because you go over a speed bump in Zwift? Going to test that later. So here is the first test, up to 5% positive and then back to minus 4% negative. And the unit moves the front fast. I was surprised how fast. I'd imagine it'd be a sort of mechanical winding up, like a stair lift or something that might not be able to respond to the hill fast enough so that by the time it's done, it's then late dealing with the hill going back down. But it is as fast as you could want. Any quicker would be unnatural. It's got a slightly mechanical noise as it moves you, but to be honest, it's one that just gets lost amongst the fan and the drive change noises. Overall, I liked it a lot. One of the things that I'd heard was that the feel was odd because it achieves its tilt by pivoting around the back wheel. So the back wheel stays on the floor and the front wheel goes up and down. In contrast to the kicker bike where the pivot is underneath you, so the front goes up, the back goes down and vice versa. Theoretically more natural. But that might be right, but in use I found the climb unit creates a more realistic feel. One of the things about the kicker bike is that it is staggeringly smooth. Mine only rocks about because it's on a rocker plate. Otherwise it'd be very stable all the time. The gear change happens without you almost being able to tell, as does the tilting. Smooth is the best way to describe it. But here with a regular bike on this setup, everything feels more outdoors. There's clunking and clicking from the gear change. Your bike is moving and flexing in a way that the kicker bike doesn't. And the contact patch of the climb on the floor is pretty small because of its curved base. That means there's quite an amount of movement in the handlebars like in real life. It just felt much more alive underneath me. And given that I'm using this setup purely to practice for outdoor racing, that's perfect. Not much else to say, that remote control unit has only three buttons. If you want to clip it to your bike, you can. The main button will lock it in position where it is and stop it being controlled by the back end. The other two buttons will then increase or decrease the angle manually. So if you want to ride along simulating an uphill climb when you aren't going uphill, you can do it. That sounds a bit pointless, but actually on really long rides that are flat, I found that quite useful on the kicker bike because just altering your angle a few degrees shifts your weight and makes being sat in the same position for hours more bearable. Now after this, I swapped over to the kicker bike, took me no more than a few minutes to strip down, re-rack the P3X and get the kicker bike in position. You wouldn't want to be doing it daily, but it takes less time it does for me to get my kit on, so setup and breakdown is a non-issue. And then this was the first time I'd ridden the kicker bike with the tilt function turned on in a while. And just like the dashboard in the car, 
I'd forgotten how cool it was. It is a different sensation to the kicker climb. The pivot point may be more natural, but the experience feels more artificial. Again, it's because it's so smooth. It feels like a simulator. It responds just as fast, there's no difference there. It's just a slightly artificial feel, but in a good way. It's like getting into a state-of-the-art driving simulator, and that would feel very cool, but different to driving on the road. The fun factor was equal on both of these. Okay, before I sum up, I want to race on the climb. There is a route on Zwift called Downtown Dolphin. It has a section before the finish straight with some rolling bumps. And I can remember riding on the kicker bike on that for the first time and thinking this is a great showcase for the tilt function. That is in about an hour's time. So back in here for that to wrap up. And off I go on my first race using the kicker climb. And in order to test the theory that whacking up the bike length will get you extra tiltiness, I entered my wheelbase in the app as being double what it actually is. Do you need to do that? No, it's just me mucking about. What's new there? Now, as I'm riding along here, waiting for some hilly bits to test it all out on, immediately it's got a different feel to racing on the kicker bike. I've said it before, it's a much more real, mechanical sensation. The drive chain noises sound like a bicycle drive chain. Actually, they sound even more like that than if you're riding outside, where that noise would be sort of lost behind you. I'm running DI2 electronic gear change on my bike, but even that has a more analog feel feel than the push button gear change on a kicker bike that you can hardly tell has even happened aside from physically feeling through your legs that you're in a different gear. I liked it a lot, although I'm not sure it's the fastest way to race, especially on short races where I like to get the bike sort of moving around a little bit underneath me. At my size and my weight, I can't really do that on that setup, more so with it being a TT bike. Something would probably snap, probably my carbon fiber spaceship frame. But what about the tilt function? That worked perfectly and quite exaggeratedly because of my messing about with the wheelbase. Basically a 2% bump became a 4% bump and so on. And that was most noticeable on the first proper little climb where four, five, 6% became eight, 10, 12%. But the unit handled it perfectly, really fast and accurate in fact. In fact, almost too accurate. You'll see there's a hill coming up and it's got a corner section where it levels off briefly before climbing again. When you ride that, you can't tell through your legs. It's just one long slide log upwards, but the bike takes that leveling off data, throws the front end down, levels you off, and then tips you back up again for the second part. Very, very cool. And then the best bit jumping to is jumping towards the end, the rolling bumps before the finish line. It is up and down and up and down, responding to those bumps immediately, and because of my alterations to the numbers, in a slightly exaggerated way. Indoors, it's about as close as you could possibly get to being outdoors. In case you're wondering how I did in the race, really bad. After a couple of laps, I let everyone go. I have Reading Half Marathon coming up in two days, so I do not need to be blowing my legs out right now. Okay, wrapping up. I thought the question was going to be, which is better, kick a bike or kick a trainer with a climb? But actually, they're both such different propositions that forget the tilt functions. Your decision will probably be based on other factors. Do you already own a bike to go on a trainer? Are you trying to ride outside or just looking for an exercise bike indoors? Do you want the ability to change it quickly and easily to suit other family members? There are basically more fundamental differences between the two options than how they move around. So instead, I think the question is simply, if you've got to kick a trainer or plan to get one, do you need to climb as well? And that's hard because ultimately it comes down to cost. If it was five pound, you'd be insane not to add it. It takes no time to put in place and it enhances the experience significantly. If it's not five pound, it's about 450 pound. Now if that's affordable, it's a brilliant addition. The trainer, the climb, the desk and the fan. If that is your indoor setup, you are gonna be delighted. Nothing is better than that. But if it's unaffordable, don't worry, you're not gonna be disappointed too much riding without it. It is certainly not an essential addition. Compromising on something like a cheap trainer is something that I'd advise against. I would say no, save up a bit longer, get yourself a proper bit of kit. But if getting the climb unit meant that your kids were gonna go about Christmas presents, that's a bit different. I mean, it, it would certainly extent, it depends on your kids, isn't it? Some of them are horrible, and if they were good, they'd understand why you needed it. Judgment call. Okay, I hope you found it all useful and informative. If you've got any questions, stick them down below. If this video is more than a week or so old though, by the time you're watching it, feel free instead to message me on Instagram if you've got a particular question, because I don't always get the time to go back through the older videos and look at the comments once they've been up a while. Right. I will see you guys on the next one. I am now off at last to get a chance to play with my gigantic new iPhone. Uh, the screen on this thing is so big that when my wife saw it, she said, that reminds me of a Tesla or the screen on that really cool Peloton bike I said you should have gotten.